Um, they are naked. There's nothing surrounding them. We all, um, we've often heard that moths will uh, surround themselves by leaf material um, before making their pupa. No, nope, these guys just crawl into the dirt and pupate right in there, right in the hollow chamber. Many will sport a tongue case, and this is what houses their proboscis, and some of, the, some of them don't have that. Any correlation between the tongue case and the ones that feed as adults? Um, what I have found is that if it does have a tongue case, based on reports, it does nectar. This, half, you know, so-so. Some of them that don't have a tongue case will still nectar, and some of them that don't have a tongue case won't. But if you, can, but if you see this, it's a pretty sure bet that this is a species that will use flowers as adult food. I've come across these digging in the dirt in my garden. Yeah. I never knew what they Now, were. there are other species that, aren't. That, that also dig in the dirt. In particular, there's a very common one called uh, the European underwing. Noctua perdue, it's a noctuid moth that does this, and that's much more common than these are going to be. It's, uh, as you can guess by the name, it is from Europe, and it's gotten incredibly abundant in the last few years. Um, I come across those more often than anything when digging in the garden, but you may find one of these eventually, but they'll be huge. They'll be like this big, oh. versus the noctuids are about maybe an inch. Uh, Don, you had a question? No, that was the, the size of them. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, these guys are usually a pretty good three, in, you know, two, three inches or so. Donna? So the ones that you said they're more common, are they the same kind of orange color here? Um, yeah, they're usually kind of a red, the, the Noctua are still going to be a reddish color. Okay. Yeah. Kim? How do they create the tongue case? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I look at ecology, I don't look at development. That's, I, I, I could ask uh, people in the Hertford lab, but I'll get back to you on that. Because <laughs> that, that is, it almost looks like it has a little handle where you can string them on, <laughs> string them on a line and then just carry them back to your truck that way. So we do have some really famous examples in biology and uh, media with these kinds of moths. Um, probably the most famous example is, um, I'm not, I'm not going to go with, uh, with Latin names here, but basically this is an orchid, which has these incredibly long uh, Stuart Corollas. Uh, well, the, there's a tube yes. in it. And yeah. what that tube is yeah. called, I'm not okay. remembering. Okay. At the very bottom of these tubes, though, you have the flower that it goes back, and then there's these long tubes, and there's nectar right at the very bottom. And when, and when trying to explain Darwin's theory of evolution, of natural selection, um, this is what a lot of critics pointed to. They point to this orchid and say, well, what, what could possibly feed there? And Darwin said, I bet there's going to be a moth that there's going to be a sphinx moth, he knew about sphinx moths, that's going to have a proboscis or some other insect that has a proboscis that is 12 inches long. 50 years later, he found it. He didn't. They found it after Darwin had passed. So this is now usually called Darwin's moth, or the Latin name, Predicta. <laughs> this is found in Madagascar only. And yes, uh, Madagascar. Oh, we actually saw this orchid where we were there. Oh, excellent. Did you see the moth? But yeah, so this, this is a 12-inch proboscis. So that's probably the most famous example biologically, Kim. So what's the size of the moth? Um, you know, three, four inches or so. Oh, well, it's, it, I mean, that's big. Pretty, pretty average size for these guys. They're pretty robust yeah. moths. But yes, very long proboscis. And then probably the most famous example from the media is the death's head hawk moth, which um, that name usually uh, that name applies to three different species, but all three of these moths have what looks to be a skull on their thorax. So from Silence of the Lambs is where we really know this uh, this moth. Where is that moth found? Uh, these are all found in Europe, in Europe and Asia. Those three species. I think there's I think they range down into Africa too. Okay, so. We'll start off immediately into it. So we have four different subfamilies. I won't go too far into taxonomy with these. Um, so even though sphinx moths represent a very identifiable family right off the get-go, there still are some. There is still some diversity within the sphinx moths themselves. So we have four different subfamilies, and you'll see the similarities and the differences as I go through. So this is a uh, sphingine, the uh, what you would call it, the, the typical subfamily. So we're going to go. This one first, uh, Manduca, 
twin caniculata. The five, it's also known as the five-spotted hawkmoth. Um, you usually find this if you do go to Washington, eastern Washington. Uh, the host plants are anything in the Solanaceae family, so things like your garden potatoes, tomatoes, tobacco, anything in that family. So this would be your garden best of a hawk moth in Washington. What do you call that the tomato warmer? This is what another a name for the larva would be the tomato warmer, yeah. Although, you know, the, the other Mandukas will also use tomato, and this will also use tobacco, and so it doesn't really matter at that point. But. So, if you are going to find it in Washington, it's usually going to be in gardens and farms. It's much more common in the southern states. You're not going to come across this moth too often in Washington, but it is here. Um, the literature says it flies around dusk, usually May through September, and then this, this is a nectaring species. What are its five spots? Which five spots is it named? Yeah. I will show you. Um, so basically, how, this is how this presentation is going to work, is I'm going to show you a pin specimen so we can look at all the markings. I'm going to show you a picture of it in the wild. You can see it here, nectaring. And then I'll show you a picture of the larva and pupa if I have it. So manduca is Latin to chew. And boy, do they do this on your tomatoes. <laughs> so the other species that uh, could easily get confused with this is manduca sexta, the six-spotted hawk moth. So the spots you're looking for are these orange spots down the side. This one, two, three, four, five, and then there's a six. And this is one, two, three, four, five. So you're looking on the at the yellow spots, six for the six spotted hawk moth, five for the five spotted hawk moth. Um, Manduca sexta uh, is the also known as the tobacco hornworm. Will be more of a brownish color. Uh, the five spotted hawk moth will be more of a of a grayish color. You see these uh, jagged lines on the hind wings? These aren't quite jagged, there's kind of more black lines in the, in the uh, six spot cotton moth. But this is, like I said, not a common one. Uh, probably won't run into it too often. You will if you go down to, say, the southeast. Okay, so now we're going to get into ones that we do see more often. This one is a common one when, we, when Wava sets up uh, light traps at conferences. Uh, this is called the, the Snowberry Sphinx, or it's also called the Vashti Sphinx. Just switch the Latin name. Uh, it is Eastern Washington, but it is named after its one of its host plants, Snowberry. Uh, typically a May through July flyer in mountainous woodlands and riparian edges is where we usually come across it. When, when uh, John Davis set up uh, his, Leavenworth, his trap in Leavenworth, we got a couple of these guys. Um, the adults are nocturnal and they are reported to nectar. <clears throat> so, very pretty larva. You'll see that just the ornateness of these larvae just continue to grow stronger. And look, and look at this little tiny tongue case. I mean, it can be pretty elaborate, it can be short, it can be non existent, so it's, it's a gradient in all of them. But what you're looking at for the Vashti Sphinx, compared to the others, and it'll get more obvious as we look at the more closely related ones, keep in mind this black dash right here. Keep that in mind. Because then we move on to the elegant sphinx. This is also eastern Washington. This is a specialty of the west coast, though. California, Oregon, Washington. And I think southern BC, but that's it. Um, similar flight time to the Vashti Sphinx a little bit later, June to August, and the adults also do nectar. Um, you're going to find it in many of the same areas. I find the, bat, the snowberry sphinx and the elegant sphinx um, at the same nights at light traps. But very different host plants. Uh, this is our only uh, sphinx that's going to use ceanothus. So if you see a, so I've come across um, hornworms on ceanothus shrubs as I'm hiking through eastern Washington. Only one thing that can be the elegant sphinx. Um, Manzanita and madrones are reported to be used in California more often than Cianopolis. And the adults are nocturnal. So notice that, notice that black line is missing on this one. Very faint on this one. It's not a solid black line. Nice purple and white stripes. Very beautiful dark blue horn. And then very short tongue. 
Not that I expect you to find pupil all that often. Or you more find them by accident. All the more reason to show us a picture. Exactly. So here's a here's a picture comparing the elegant sphinx and the and the uh, snowberry sphinx. You see that that well-defined line on uh, the snowberry sphinx and how it's not even really there on the elegant sphinx. Instead, it has more of this pale white line or band. This, the Vashti Sphinx is also much smaller. This is your typical size Vashti Sphinx, this one right here. And this is not the elegant Sphinx, but this is a typical size for an elegant Sphinx. So there is some size difference as well. But you know, you get a small male elegant Sphinx versus a large female Snowberry Sphinx, and it can, it can get confusing there. So mainly you're looking for this black line. Okay, wild cherry sphinx, um, another eastern Washington, uh, usually flies July. I mean, there's not a whole lot of records for these, so these are just approximate whatever's in the text, uh, whatever's on websites that track, uh, that track these. Um, and so most of our records come from people walking out their front door and there's a sphinx moth hanging out on the porch. Um, these adults are nocturnal, they also are said to nectar. But this one's interesting that there's really no clear habitat associations here as far as elevation, as far as vegetation type. All we can really say is that it's mainly in wooded areas. Um, host plants are mainly, true to the name, prunus and nile species. So you have wild cherries, apples, that's mainly what they're going for. Um, and what you say wild gonna, cherries and apples, do they use any domestic cherries or apples? I believe they do. Okay. I believe. I'll have to double check, but I believe they I believe they do, but since it's eastern Washington and since most of our uh, domestic ones are sprayed quite a bit, I imagine their range is greatly diminished because of that. Um, but this is a pretty rare one to come across. We did come across one um, during our 2007 Leavenworth uh, conference, and this is it on um, one of the participants' hands. Very nice larva. You notice that it has uh, not as broad, purple and white, no blue on the horn there. And you're going to find it on completely different host plants. But one thing to notice that's different about these from our previous ones. So you see the, the, the costa of these. This one has some white. This one has very little white. Notice how white that shoulder gets, I mean, especially in this individual there. Really white shoulder, and you have this wavy black edged white line that the others don't have. Those two characteristics are going to help you separate this species from the other two. So our black, white, gray moths can be confused with each other. But there are a few uh, things to help tell them apart. Mainly if you look at this area, that should, that should help you with what moth you're dealing with. Okay, last of our uh, gray, white, black ones is the great ash sphinx. And this, is, this one's unique in where you're going to find it. You're going to find this one in southwestern Washington. This is not an eastern one. And it's interesting because you'll find it all over the east, you know, from New England down, down to Florida, across the southern part of the U.S., and then it goes right, and then it goes up into, uh, goes up into southwestern Washington. This is mirrored with quite a few of our butterflies. I believe the dun skipper mirrors that, um, mirrors that uh, range. But with a name like Great Ash, you can once again guess what the host plants are. So. Most plants are going to be ash, but also cherry, privet, lilac has been used, a variety of, of others. Um, but mostly you're going to find this in woodlands, scrublands. The adults are nocturnal, they do nectar, fly in high summer. But notice this one's just a very even gray. There's not this mixing of white areas and black areas and gray areas like with these others. It's just this un uniformly ash gray. So not only does ash really help you with uh, associating with the host plant, but it also gives you an idea of what kind of gray you're looking at. So you're going to find this mostly on ash, um, 
but it, it will use your yard lilacs, but mostly southwestern Washington. The only person I know of in Washington that's seen it is uh, John Davis, and that he lives down in the Columbia Gorge, where that's where you're going to find this guy. So just this evenly gray four-wing is going to help you distinguish the great ash wings as well as area. Not eastern Washington, southwestern Washington. Okay, so we get into the smurns today. All of these are non-feeding. As adults, they do not nectar. They have no functional mouth parts. Their only job is to find each other, mate, and lay their eggs. So essentially, they're starving them. So they, they live until they starve to death, or until a jay finds them. So we're going to start off with our most common one. This is the one-eyed sphinx. Now, that's not to say it has only one eye. It does have two compound eyes. And there is, maybe because it's, there's one eye on each wing, two eyes there. These are not functional eyes, you know, but I sometimes have to explain that to people. So this is, this is utilizing the uh, classic scare tactic. Normally when sphinx moths sit while they're resting, they look much like this. Wings covering those bright eye spots. Something disturbs it a jay and then it will flash those eye spots. Eye spots are scary in nature. Um, much longer flight period, May through August, which is uh, which is odd for a critter that doesn't feed. It has a very prolonged flight period, even though we, we have evidence that there's only one generation here. Now, this is also taking into account things from sea level to higher elevation, so that's probably why it has such an elongated, such a long flight period. Um, I said these are night flying, do not feed. Usually find these in riparian areas due to their host plants. Their host plants are willows and poplars. But this is the one that most often you're going to see if you walk out of your house and there's a sphinx moth sitting on your porch light. This is likely going to be it. Outside of Washington, does it have a very broad distribution? It does. Very broad. Um, if you want to look at that in more detail, I'll show you that in there, but I believe it's Oh, it's nearly nationwide. And pretty far. Um, no, the other one is pretty far north. So this one extends a little bit into southern Canada, but it's nearly nationwide. I think you don't find it in the most driest of areas in our country. But, you know, people that I know from the East Coast see this guy too. Um, and in our state, it comes in two different phases the dark phase and the light phase, which is a very light brown. So these two right here, same species. Different colors. But one thing that's going to be consistent on both of them is I like to think of this mark at the shoulder as a bird. You're seeing the head, beak, going down to the neck. Looks more like a finch here. But that helps. Not many of the others have that. It does take a little bit of imagination. You're not seeing the bird yet. Can you help not yet. <laughs> Maybe it'll become more apparent when, I look, when we look at the others. It's just the head of just, just the head. I see a You're just, beak. just, just looking. Yep, the beak. Just the beak. <coughs> just the beak. Imagine there's a little high eye there. You're just looking at the, at the face. Top of the head's chopped off. A little bit, yeah. So it's a little bit of imagination, but I find that works for identifying the species. Otherwise, you have this nice pink, single pupiled eye. This is the larva, much more slender than, say, what we saw with the previous species, where there's these really bulbous larvae. This probably helps it to camouflage with the slender willow leaves, I'm guessing. So here's the, uh, here's the here's a mating pair. Much like with our butterflies, the males are smaller than the females. May females usually have a very large bulbous abdomen because they're full of eggs. And the male very skinny because he only has one job to fertilize those eggs. So once again, this species only jobs to mate. Doesn't nectar, anything like that, and you won't find it at flowers. So let me move on to our next most common species, you'd say, in, uh, in Washington, in, in, or at least in the Seattle area. Uh, and that's the blinded sphinx. Once again, that's not to say this moth can't see. It can see, but the idea I think the way that it got the blinded name is that the eye spots have no pupils. You go back to the other one. There's a black spot in that white dot. 
In this one, there is none. Mm. But there are ways to tell them based on just the, top, on the four wings. So if you do come across a moth, or someone sends you a photograph where the, where the wings are closed, you can still tell who it is. I always nudge the rope at the sea. So you can usually get, push it without it flying away. Well, and you have, you have reason to anyway, to miss that. Of course. Of course. That is just stunning. It's, it's about as pink as you'll ever see on a prayer. Uh, so once again, these are nocturnal, do not feed. They're found in many of the same places as the one-eyed sphinx. Um, and they are a generalist feeder. They'll feed on cherry, lilac, oh, you willows, cottonwoods, you maples, a lot of different things. So therefore, they occupy a wide range, not only in Washington, but in the United States. Um, Al found one on the on the inner urban trail. Mm, Burke Gilman Trail. Burke Gilman Trail. He he's you saved a larva from being eaten by a crow. <laughs> yeah, and it was really tough. That crow was pecking at it, did no damage whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Tough and tough little guys. It rolled to me as a ball. I thought it was a wad of chewing gum at first. <laughs> but he sent me the picture of the adult. It turned out to be this guy. So the blinded sphinx and the one-eyed sphinx are going to be your two most likely candidates, or at least two like two most likely you're going to see in Seattle. I unfortunately do not have a specimen of this guy to show you. I saw my first one dead at the conference this year. I've yet to really come across this, but I get I get records sent to me every year. And um, with this year, with many of our butterflies having a poor year, these two actually did pretty well. I got a lot of records of these two. So one thing you're going to look at is that it doesn't have that clear, we'll call it a bird's beak for now, instead of a bird's head, that profile. Um, very green larva, not really much to speak of as far as decoration. But one thing to look for on this species, you see this dot? This is what we call the discal spot. And it is lacking in the one-eyed sphinx. Notice how scalloped these wing edges are. Not so scalloped in the, in the one-eyed sphinx. Scalloped and white bordered. And white bordered. But mostly, if you look at that, you look for that spot. If that spot's not there, it's not this one. But they're about the same size. They're common, so they can get confused. But even though you don't need the hind wings, to tell who it is, oh, if you find one, I'd still encourage you to try to look at it. Okay, so then we move on to the small-eyed sphinx. Small-eyed probably because of the small spots, or maybe because it's the smaller of our eyed sphinx. But pretty distinctive from our other two eyed sphinx in that this one's red. This one's a very nice burgundy red color. You're going to find it in eastern Washington. Uh, not western, not not western Washington, only eastern Washington. Whereas the other two are also found in eastern Washington. Uh, May through September flight a little bit later, a little bit extended. Um, once again, do not feed in or mostly found in riparian situations. I've had a night where all three. Well, I just told you I hadn't seen the, I hadn't seen the blinded sphinx before, but this will come to the lights, the same lights that the one-eyed sphinxes will come to. Um, host plants are rosaceae families, so usually prunus trees, so your cherry trees, um, things of that nature. All these specks, all these specks you see on the thorax there, that speaks to the difficulties of, rate of keeping a collection. That's dermestid beetle species. So I nearly lost the specimen to dermestid beetles. You know, if, you, if any of you don't know what those are, they're beetles that basically come in, they're larvae, and eat uh, dead protein, which is what these are. So, and what do you do about it? Um, well, I have these thin little cardboard boxes, which you can put fumigant strips in there to deter beetles from entering, but since these are really flimsy, um, that smell is just going to permeate the room, so that's not an option. <laughs> So I, I do weekly, weekly checks through my boxes, and what I do is I look to see if there's a pile of that dust beneath a specimen. And if there is, that's a sure sign that there's something in there eating it. So I just toss the whole box into the freezer for a couple days. That'll kill it. 
So maintaining a collection is a lot of work. <laughs> so this is the this is the live adult, not the spread specimen. It's someone described it as an oil slick. You, know, you see you see an oil slick on the beach that has like these waves of different color on it. It's really just a gorgeous creature. And if you see it out in the wild, these red spots all over it, no other, no other sphinx moth category has those. It's also been called the sweetheart sphinx because of all these red spots. You don't know what myops would mean, would you? I don't. I could probably find it in here. Myopic means mere sighted. Which I think they are. <laughs> okay, so let me go on, move on to the modest sphinx. Um, Eastern Washington again. May through July, nocturnal, don't feed, sensing a pattern within the Smyrindinae subfamily. And you're going to find these in riparian areas rich in willows and poplars. Um, this is large, very large. I mean, you look at the, this is a robust, robust critter. Five inches typical wingspan. He's not modest. <laughs> well, <laughs> kind of makes you wonder why he got that name. So, I'm going to show you the other species that, the other lookalike species to this, before I just start discussing the points. Because otherwise it's not going to mean much to you. Picture of the larva. Oh, and these guys get huge. They get like six inches. Big larva. Sphinx moths are great for kids. So <laughs> Um, and there's the adult, so perhaps it's modest because it's only our second biggest sphinx. Our first biggest is the western poplar sphinx, or it's also known as just the western sphinx, occident, meaning western. So this is our other, um, we have other willows feeding, but look alike to our modest sphinx. So maybe it's modest because it's okay with being number two. Um, but this is primarily going to be in southeastern Washington. Um, once again, nocturnal don't feed. Just about the same flight time as Modesta here. Riparian habitats and host plants are willows and poplars, so much the same. Ecologically, anyway, just a different area. Whereas the modest sphinx ranges all over the uh, United States. This is pretty much just west of the Rocky Mountains. Rocky Mountains west of the, uh, west of the uh, Cascade Mountains. So the two things to look for, you're going to see that this black spot here is in a well-defined triangle. Really obvious on this, there's a well-defined black triangle there. And in here it's just kind of a black line. Boy, you could kind of draw a triangle there. It's ironic that our largest ones are often the hardest to tell apart, just like our fritillaries. But these are the two sphinx that I have the hardest time telling apart when people send in photographs, particularly when they're closed winged. So then here's the larva, much the same as Modesta, and the adult at, a, at someone's screen door. The females here regularly get six inches. I mean, just to, to imagine the force behind these, I was, at a, I was at a light trap with about a dozen of these guys, a dozen of these Modestas, and one of them hit me in the back of the head. <laughs> I thought it was a clumsy bat. I looked down and it's, there's a moth flopping on the ground. But when you hold these guys behind, much as you would hold butterflies behind the wings, uh, behind the shoulders, you can really feel these muscles throbbing to get out. And they can often work themselves out too. So, we'll go back again. Very extensive red on the western poplar sphinx. No real well-defined triangle. I think that works half the time. Half the time's better than, which I guess is pretty random too, and you only have two to work with. <laughs> Supposedly less extensive red, but I guess more of a maroon red, whereas this has been called a red red, a brick red. There's, there's variation on these guys too. These guys have a light phase shown here and a dark phase. So these guys can be tough. I mean, if you're in northeastern Washington, you can be pretty sure that it's going to be um, the modest sphinx. But if you're in southeastern Washington, all bets are off. There is one thing that I have noted that kind of helps, which the triangle kind of helps. 
and the color of red kind of helps. But maybe using a combination of them will help. You notice that both of them have this little projection in that band. But you'll notice this one, that on the western poplar sphinx, that little projection is a little higher up on the wing. Whereas this one's a little bit lower. There's a different shape to it. And I found using that in combination with the black triangle or absence of, and the color of the red, sometimes helps. But if you still have trouble with these guys, so do I. <laughs> These are the two that I struggle with identifying most. But I do like the uh, genus name of these two. Packy Sphinx. The big boys. <laughs> and, well, it really should be the big girls. The girls are the big ones. So, haven't seen this one yet. Intend to. Have seen the modest Sphinx in good numbers. There are real, there are real treasures to find out there. Okay, so now I'm moving to some really, really cool Sphinx spots. Ones that I'm going to let Kim tell you the story of. <coughs> Alright. De La Fonnotini. Also known as our clear wings. So this is, these are not to be confused with um, the other clear wing moths that mimic bees and wasps, the Societae which are small, that really do look like tiny hornets. But instead of seeing mandibles, you're going to see a proboscis. These guys are pretty big body. They're said to uh, imitate bumblebees instead. Um, but this is our hummingbird clearwing moth, which does imitate a hummingbird. Is that what we saw? Oh, no. not, not this one. No. Or other one. So this is Hemeris thisbe, primarily thought to be a, a eastern species, and then extending west up into Alaska, um, but diagonally. Never really reached Washington. John Davis, though, found it in his yard. He has a great photograph of it, so we have photo document, documentation that's here. Whether, whether it is here permanently, maybe it was a migrant or a vagrant, or whether it moved in on some plant, we really don't know. Um, just keep looking out for it, or you know, John Davis reproduces the photograph again. That sh that'll be evidence that it actually is here, but it has been found in Washington, so it is on our list. Typically flies April through August, but this is the great news that they're diurnal. They fly during the day and they nectar heavily. Um, wide variety of host plants, most often in our area, or at least in you know BC where it is regularly found, be snowberry and honeysuckle most often, but it's also been recorded on hawthorn and viburnum. And you're going to find this in a variety, this one in a variety of habitats, but mostly you're going to find it in gardens, young woodlands, basically these open, lush, herbaceous areas. I mean, it's clear. You can see right through it. Typical, but still typical, sphinx looking caterpillar, right? It's got the horn, pretty bulbous. This tribe, though, makes its pupa in leaf litter. It doesn't dig down. Instead, it will just crumple up a bunch of leaves and make a very loose cocoon that really offers no protection at all. There's not much behind that cocoon. And that tail. Yeah. Oh, yeah, these little, these little pencil tufts of scales there, that's, that's the scent. That's where the scent plume is going to come from. Um, at night, the females, like, just like our silk moths and mini moths, will basically um, sit at a spot, except for these guys, since, because they're diurnal, but our nocturnal ones are going to sit, some, sit on a branch, some exposed area. The females are going to emit, emit a scent. They're going to, ex they're going to extend a scent gland. Um, in some moths, this is extremely complex, and in some it's just a little bowl that just pops out of their abdomen. And then the wind takes their scent, and it's the male's job to find that. So notice, how red, the, how red this is, though. Notice how red the scales on the wings are compared to our next one. So this is the snowberry clearing, or called the bumblebee hawk moth, because it's imitating a bumblebee. Supposedly. Is it about the size of a bumblebee? It is. It is. Huh. And this is, and even though this is a hummingbird, it's still about you know two, two and a half inches, so small hummingbird. But yeah. still, still does confuse people. Um, so this one's two broods. 
uh, flies June through August. Um, it's throughout Montaigne, Washington, but we really don't have a good idea of where this is because so many people see this and pass it off as a bumblebee. Yeah. And so it could be much more widespread than we think it is. Um, the adults are nocturnal just like the other ones. They nectar. The uh, host plants include, as the name might suggest, snowberry most often has also been found on honeysuckle and dogwood. So you notice though that this one's very much like a bumblebee. It's black and yellow. It doesn't have that red that the hummingbird clearing would. This one I found, um, this one I found in Yakima, Oak Creek Canyon. The, uh, the clouds have come, have come overhead. The butterflies have stopped flying. We decided to look for larvae. When I looked through here, and in the back of my mind, I knew about this guy. <coughs> but I had an eye on Earth when I thought it was a bumblebee. That looks like a bumblebee, doesn't it? So little, it's like something doesn't look quite bumblebee-ish about it. And it was most definitely the bumblebee hawk moth. In much of the literature, you're going you're gonna to see it referred to as Hemeris definis, um, which was thought to be a coast-to-coast -coast species. Uh, recent work has shown that we have a western and eastern sister species group. So now our western species is called Hemeris thetis, and then the eastern is divinus. So, Kim, do you want to recall our encounter with this species in, during our uh, chumpstick count? So it was, uh, our car was one of three teams that was heading up chumpstick, or a uh, up to the top of Chumstick. Mm -hmm. And we weren't having the best of butterfly days, but we were having a fabulous moth day. I probably shouldn't say that. So we were having a fabulous moth day. And one of the best, well, no, I can't even say that, but I've never seen this before. I didn't even know it existed until that day. And, uh, and it was nectaring on this uh, blue flower, and it was a little penstemon that was just barely like six inches. Oh, it wasn't even a penstemon. Barely six inches off the ground, the tiniest little pink, pink flower, flower you could possibly pink. imagine. You don't know what it was. No, mm -hmm. it's unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, it was. It was a very. It was just very exciting to see. It. But it was finding those with ease. It flew yeah. straight. It flew very straight. Yeah. And the thing, basically, as we watched this, because I caught the first one, and it was. It was funny because I had mentioned this to Kim and Melanie the day that day that there were uh, sphinx moths that flew during the day of mimic bumblebees, and they said no way. <laughs> a mile later, I found one. For them. <laughs> so I caught it in the jar and then let it go. Well, we walked down a trail, otherwise and we found another one. We were discussing how you might actually distinguish this from a bumblebee, and one thing we knew as it was nectar, as we noticed as it was nectaring. Have you noticed that when bumblebees land on a flower, they land, right? They kind of crawl around, they land, they probe it. These guys hover. So that's one way you're going to distinguish it. Like, that looks like a bumblebee, but it's hovering when it visits each flower. It doesn't actually land on it. So by flight, you could distinguish this from, from a bumblebee. Maybe the birds have figured that out, too. So this Dave? is a... Oh, was that your chumstick springs where you found them? Uh, that was during... That was... Um, it was the stop up the road from Chumstick Springs. If you remember me, where you and I met um, last year, we ran into each other on, on that road. Um, and this guy's been out so, so many times. <laughs> I think so. Okay, but it was, it was at that bend where the road just keeps going up, um, keeps going up Dirty Canyon, and then all of a sudden it's that first sharp switch. Oh, yeah, back. yeah, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's where he found them. Well, so it was way down. Yeah, the, the second one that we found, it could could have been the one I originally released. It could have been an actual second mm -hmm. individual, but... Up at Chumstick Springs, which is, you know, just below the, the peak, uh, there, there's sometimes lots of them up there. We've seen uh, days where you might see ten of them around. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty amazing. So, I mean, these are probably more widespread than we think. Just have to give that, that bumblebee a second look. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they're really... Really cool um, sphinx. David, uh -huh. so that photo there at the top left photo, the wings look very uh, bluish. Is that just the way the light was that, that day? Was the, that was the light, the angle of the camera versus the overhead light. That's, yeah, no. Otherwise, they're, they're very clear. Gotcha. Just very, see, really no color tone. Interestingly, though, 
when they come out of the pupa, they're not, they're not clear. All these have scales on them. Mm -hmm. So they are actually scaled. I couldn't find a picture of that. But on their first flight, those scales are so loosely attached, they all blow off. Mm -hmm. Whereas all these scales are firmly attached. Mm -hmm. So if you do ever find a larva and rear it through and you get one of these, when you first see it, it'll have scales on it. But what the heck is that? You'll look through the guys and say, well, it's a bumblebee, but what's with all these scales? And then it will fly over its first time and it'll show, show you who it is. The larva is a good example of why they call them sphinx moths. Because it supposedly is supposedly it kind of looks like the Egyptian sphinx. And that may take as much imagination as my bird head on the one-eyed sphinx. Is that the only larva that has a horn at the end? It's just the sphinx? The sphinx moths? Yeah. Um, well, you're going to have a lot of different categories that will have some kind of appendage. As far as a really distinct horn like that, I, I can't say for sure, but this size of larva, absolutely. Um, you're going to find other, like, say, um, soap moth categories. Like, have you ever seen the hickory horn devil? Just all these different horns branching out these all these all these different directions. But sphinx moths are going to be very smooth, <laughs> unornated larva with just a single horn at the end. Um, so I mean, they, they should be not only fairly distinctive adult moths, but they should be fairly distinctive larva too. Okay, um, so only two in that subfamily, but a very unique and very cool subfamily, to say the least. Also, um, it almost looks like someone closed those caterpillars. <laughs> yes. Well, these caterpillars are easy. I'll talk a little bit. About, I'll talk a little bit about about uh, raising these guys a little later, because some of them are fairly easy to raise and get eggs from the females. Um, so when you're raising them, and you've taken hundreds of photos as the larva um, as the larva develops, and you might get a few of those really cool shots. Oh yeah, I mean, in particular, that one's a real, very nice looking <laughs> shot. Okay, so we got six more confirmed regular species in Washington. I think that's another thing that draws me about the sphinx moths, is that it's diverse enough that we have 19, which is able to take up a meeting like this, but it's a small enough group that you, you can wrap your head around it. It's not like, oh, it's not like those noctuids or geometrids or something like that. It's not like the pug moths where we have 120 species. Anyway, okay, so we're now getting into some really colorful ones and some really unique ones just in their own right, not even as a group, but just individually as each species. So this is Clark's Day Sphinx, as you can guess by the name, it's a diurnal. Um, it nectars, even though apparently the, uh, the proboscis is not that well developed, it has been reported in flowers. Um, but this is going to be an early, uh, a, a spring species. This is going to be a spring species. Very scattered in Washington records, it's not common. Um, you're going to find it in dry, low elevation forests, usually like ponderosa pine forests. And the host plants are going to eat primroses. Um, so kind of this very mauve, not mauve, um, olive green with uh, this blackboard orange hindwing. This is fresh. So I mean, you know, this is a little bit more of a warm specimen, but I mean, that's, that's fresh. That's really how bright these guys can be. Very cool looking larva as well, black and white with these very thickly rimmed uh, sphericals. I see no horn. You see no horn. The next three species lack what you would call a horn, but they're still pretty big. So, I haven't seen this guy. And John Davis, our moth guy, has seen this once. So, that might tell you how rare they actually they are. Not really much else to say. I think it just has to do with the fact that they live in places that we're not looking at the right time of year. This should be called the Bumblebee Sphinx. <laughs> but it's called the Yellow Banded Day Sphinx. Now this guy is rare. And likely because it flies at a time when we're not looking for it. Even though you might say, April, June, we're looking for it. But this lives in high elevation areas, um, usually open meadows where we would think, yeah, well, we go to the open meadows.
just look for butterflies. But these guys are often flying while there's still snow on the ground. So when we think of high meadows, um, high open meadows, we're thinking July, August, these guys are done. The adults do nectar. They are diurnal. Why would you be nocturnal if you look like a bumblebee? <laughs> or why would you look, look like a bumblebee without using, without using that disguise? So same as the Clark Sphinx, uh, uh, Clark Sphinx scattered Washington records, but it's all high elevation, open patches and coniferous forests, uh, rich in fireweed. This is the only confirmed host plant. There's some suspicions of thimbleberry, but that hasn't been confirmed. Are all of these moths inclined to fly in cooler and cloudy weather as opposed to butterflies, which like it's sunny and warm? So yes. You're thinking, April, it's not going to be very warm at higher elevation. April, May, June at high elevation is still pretty cool for butterflies, so we're not over there. But for a very robust moth like this that can vibrate its wings and get those flight muscles going, that body can hold quite a bit of heat. So we can fly around. Now the best way that's going to, that you're going to find this one, because it is rare, you're not going to find the adult all that often. Instead, look on the fireweed for these big, black caterpillars with no horn, but instead this eye where the horn would be. That's going to that's gonna be how we're going to find more records of this species, is by looking for the larva. Because the larva, while we're out there looking at butterflies, that's when the larva are going to be out. They're going to overwinter at the pupa stage, so it's in July and August when we're going to find the larva. So this is one of them just trying desperately to fly in the cold weather. Um, the, Matthew is saying that there was snow literally a couple meters away from this individual, so they fly when the butterflies are just not out. Okay, so I mean, I'm hearing more wow as we go through this. Okay, so the Pacific Green Sphinx is also called the Bear Sphinx. I, maybe because it's fuzzy, but so are the others. I'm not sure. So this takes a special effort to find in the flight period. Wow. <laughs> You've got to be out of your mind. <laughs> so eastern Washington flies in winter into early spring. The adults don't feed. Um, and they are nocturnal. So we got to go out into eastern Washington at night. We have to go out to eastern Washington at night in the winter to find these. We have to set up a light trap. Now light traps in you know, June, July, August if you're looking for a sphinx, well, you're going to get a ton of, ton of other stuff that's going to interest you. It's going to be like consolation prizes. Here, you may get nothing if you set up a light trap in February. Um, host plants are on a Gracie, so primrose family. Eating primrose. Eating primrose. It's um, a summer, summer family from primrose. Okay, okay. Um, I'm the sphinx moth guy, not the, not the plant guy. <laughs> that's why we have to use so they live in more oak chaparral habitat at lower elevations, open pine forests at modern elevations. And I regret that I have found this guy, not as an adult, as larva. Um, and I had, and I brought it home, and I looked in the literature, and apparently in the literature it said that a lot of them just seem to lose the will to live at the pupation stage. They get to the pupation stage and they just die. So I had brought this, this larva home. The larva looked like this. Tan head, black, once again, that eye, where the horn should be. And so I was sure that that's what it was. And I found one, and another student on the entomology trip that I was on found one. So we actually found a population of them. So this, this kind of uh, speaks to trying to find the larva. Unless, I mean, I do intend on going back to that area in February, as crazy as that sounds, to try to find these adults, but uh, I'll settle with the larva for now. When did you find the larva? So this was in, um, this was in July of, this was in July last year, so in 2010, um, mid-July, I brought it home. No, I apologize, excuse me. It's, it was um, late May. You're a long time ago. Yeah, oh yeah. But it, it was already on the ground searching for a place to, to dig. Yeah. So I took this larva home, 
put it in a jar with some substrate for it to bury. And it kind of carved out a little shallow area to pupate in, and it just sat there for a week. And it started turning this weird yellow-green color, and I thought, great, it's one of those that boss the little live. Come back home from work one day, and there's a fresh green pupa there. And I thought, yes, I made it. I still have the pupa. <laughs> It was moving for about a year and hasn't emerged and it's no longer moving, so it's probably dead. Uh, I forgot to bring the, the pupa, so I, I apologize. But it was about this big. Nice chestnut brown. Um, probably what my mistake was, was that uh, I took a moth that is used to flying in January and March to western Washington. So the pupa did not get the cold signal that it needed that winter had passed, because our winters in the Puget Sound are fairly mild. So we didn't get much freezing. So it was probably waiting for that time to come for a year, and it never did. So when it does pupate, it doesn't develop. It waits for that long period of cold before it does develop as the moth inside the pupa. So what I should have done is probably threw it in my refrigerator for a couple months. But I left it outside, and you know, we get 40 degrees plus, and just didn't give it the signal it needed. It's probably what happened. So here it is, it, well, it looks like flocks. But basically these long tube flowers. <clears throat> I mean, just a really gorgeous creature. Once again, another nice pink one. Really cool looking one with these orange, yellow, black circle spots, yellow horns. But there's quite a bit of diversity in the color of this. They can be nearly black, they can be brown, they can be this bright green color. There are a couple of near lookalikes. So this is the gallium sphinx. This is another very scattered, uh, rarer species than, uh, definitely rarer than Lineata. Definitely uh, rarer than the white line sphinx. You're going to find this more in mountainous areas, mostly eastern Washington. There's a couple of records in mountainous areas in western Washington. May through August, the adults do nectar and they fly by day and night. And the best association we can get is wet, boggy areas. Host plants include uh, fireweed, bed straw, and primroses. And gallium is the genus for bed straw, yes? Yes, okay. that's that's wrong. Okay, and so when you said primroses, can I ask, is that evening primroses or it's, it's the on, it's the on a gray seed. So evening so it's the evening primrose. So you'll learn that now. <laughs> we'll do. So gallium sphinx, another sphinx named after a, it's its host. So you notice this black spot here, and you'll notice this kind of tan, gold, orange, yellow, whatever color you want to call it, band. And it doesn't encircle this spot like it will our next species. So this is our next species, the Spurge hawk moth. This is a new Washington record as of this year. I got a photo sent in from John Bowman in Spokane. You notice that the tan here, the tan band is much wider and completely encloses this black this spot. This was intentionally introduced into uh, parts of the Intermountain West to control leafy spurge, which is a, uh, uh, an aggressive uh, non-native. And uh, places where they, there's a nice, there's a nice account here that the next year they, they estimated over a million larvae in the fields that they had introduced it in. So it can be extremely abundant. And leafy spurge is a toxic plant, much like the milkweed that our monarch uses, so you would expect that maybe it's a, uh, Brightly colored oh, caterpillar. Oh, goodness. You notice the double row of spots there versus our gallium sphinx, which has the single spot. But yeah, it can be black, bright red, yellow, but basically it's very bright colored saying, you can eat me, but you're going to regret it. Um, these guys will also, when disturbed, start vomiting quite violently. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to move through these really quickly. These are species that um, either skim really close to Washington or have been found here in the past. Um, but just really quickly. And so our first one we're going to look at is another non-native that we introduced. Whether intentionally or not, we don't know. 
So this is the Elephant Hawk Moth. Don't ask me how it got that name. Um, it was introduced into Vancouver, BC, area called Pitt Meadows. Um, they took 24 adults at lights in one night. Larva is supposedly is supposed to be imitating a snake, but oh, well, there's nothing like that. Pink, 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 pink. <coughs> how big is that? About three, four inches. Don. Introduced accidentally, or we don't know. We don't. Well, I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't a. Um, we know it wasn't an official introduction, um, but it's. It uses fireweed, so there's really no reason to suspect that it won't spread. Um, it has been spreading in the Vancouver area, so we'll see how fast it does. But I mean, I'm in Bellingham, so kind of secretly hoping to get one of these. How long ago was this? I'd rather it not be there. But what's that? How long ago was it released? Um. Estimating, oh, estimating 1995 that it was, that, that's when it was first found. And it's native to where? Native to Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we don't know, I mean, it could have been accidentally introduced or maybe someone said, wow, that's beautiful, I wish I had it in my hometown okay. and maybe it, yeah. introduced it that way. But there was no official release. So, all right, so it's the Sequoia Sphinx, um, mm -hmm. currently north to northern Oregon, juniper host plants. Caterpillar greatly blends in with the juniper. This is small. This is about maybe two inches. So it's small for a sphinx, but it's still a sphinx, and it's just uniformly gray with a few little black lines and just this uniform brown hindwing. <coughs> so definitely be on the lookout for this in southeastern Washington, where we do have quite a bit of juniper. I suspect that it's just been overlooked. Um, thinking about traveling to the juniper dunes wilderness and taking a light trap out there. That larva is on incense cedar, uh, Calocetus decurrens. Further it's south it is found on incense cedar, but up here um, it's been found on western red cedar and uh, juniper. Hmm. But for some reason it doesn't do well on our wet west coast forest. Twin spotted sphinx. Um, this one it skirts northeastern Washington, much like our much like the Aphrodite fritillary, where it's kind of just there, and you think it's got to be there, we're just not seeing it. Willow host plants, much like our one-eyed sphinx, you'll see this very much like it, but a couple ways to tell it apart. This spot is bisected, so it's not a nice pupil; it's bisected into two spots. This is called the twin-spotted sphinx. You also notice this uh, this crescent moon here, which this does not have. And then there's usually this dark patch which, which kind of creates a brown dash which is lacking in the one-eyed sphinx. So this would be something for our friends in the northeast that we met, that we made this year to look out for. And then the yellow sphinx, I, I got an email from Bob Pyle um, asking if this was one of them and there was an acquaintance of Pyle's so they did find a larva on a potted U4 plant um, and reared it through and it ended up being this yellow sphinx. Now we have to ask, did it come in on the plant, or did it actually come here <coughs> regular? Did it come here by itself? Because uh, it has straight north all the way north to New England. Very few records um, west of the Rockies this far north, but conceivably it could have. So we really don't know about that. So this is one that does straight north. Okay, so. That's all for the sphinxes. We've got a few to look out for. We've got 19 known resident sphinxes in Washington. A few of my references. This book came out in 2007. Wonderful book. Will cost you. Uh, the Hawk Moths in North, North America. We've got our nice white line sphinx moth on it. It's about $90 right now. but It covers all 127 sphinxes of North America. And then Bill Oleki's uh, Sphingidae of the United States. Um, if you just search Sphingidae of the United States, you'll find it on Google. And he has tons of photos of larvae, adults, submitted by tons of contributors. Bugguide.net is a great image resource. And then, of course, butterfliesandmoths.org is a way that you can not only see where they've been found, but also submit your findings as you, as you find them. Because I'm teaching you this so that I have more eyes out there looking for these guys. And if you want, you can come up here and take a look at the few that I have up here. How long did I take you over? This is the wild cherry size.
how extensive that is. Yeah. 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 I do like spreading these guys because they're so robust, you really don't have to worry about oh, hurting them. Yeah. They are so okay. tough, even in, even in death, that well, well, they, you can snap back a couple times, you don't have to worry, they're, they're not, they're not going to hurt.